The fallacy that we're looking at in this video is one that's not as frequently discussed as the one that's its opposite, the appeal to tradition. The one that we're looking at here is the appeal to novelty. Some critical thinking textbooks don't discuss it. Uh, they probably all should because you do see it being made quite frequently. And it, it appeals to something within us that is, ironically enough, age old. So. What we're going to do in this video is talk about eight things. We're going to talk about what the appeal to novelty is. Then we'll look carefully at the argument structure of the appeal to novelty. We'll talk about why it's a fallacy, what goes wrong with reasoning or, or thinking in this fallacy. We'll look at some common situations in which you can expect to see it arise. Then we'll look at three examples of the fallacy. If you want to see more examples, we're going to be uploading videos that are just focused on providing you examples later on. We'll talk about how you can spot this fallacy when other people are making it. Then for students, we'll talk about what this fallacy often gets mistaken for. And we'll finish up by talking about how you can avoid this fallacy in your own thinking, your own inquiry, your own reasoning and decision making. So, what is the fallacy of appeal to novelty? Um, it's got a few other synonyms, not too many. Appeal to the new, the argumentum ad uh, novitatum, if you want to use the Latin uh, phrase for it, which I guess would make you a little bit old-fashioned, which would be kind of a funny way to, to do it. It's, it's really an opposite fallacy to the appeal to tradition. The appeal to tradition says that because a belief has been thought to be true by people in the past, we should believe it to be true in the present. The fallacy of appeal to novelty does the exact opposite. It says that because a claim has been believed to be true for a long time by many people, because of that, the claim is false. Uh, another version of this says that because something is newer, it's therefore good or better or true or truer than, than other things that are, that are older. So the structure of the fallacy, um, it, it really depends on how we're um, laying it out. One thing that's going to come up is saying X has been believed to be true for a long time or saying Y is brand new, and then there's going to be some, some hidden premises. And these are the assumptions that are being made, the implicit premises. One of them is that people in the present are always better informed than people were in the past. Rather shaky, questionable assumption if you know much about you know, people in the present and the past. Another um, hidden assumption, when something has been believed for a long time, it's because that the people who believed in it were poorly informed about its truth or falsity. Uh, another hidden premise could be perhaps something like, newer is always better. Um, now the conclusion is going to be that X is false in the present and you should accept Y instead. So if we want to represent this graphically, this is one of those sort of contrast ones where we're saying, um, just like as with you know straw man or with the uh, appeal to exclusivity, because something else is bad, something else is good, or because something else is false, something else is true. So you notice that what we've got first is a whole you know argument from from the past. You know the past people believe that X is true. And so therefore X is true in the present. But we know that those past people are a bunch of dummies compared to present people. So not X is true. Or, or Y, which is something brand new, replacing X, is true in the present. Now, what's wrong with this? There's a basic confusion being committed. It confuses having believed a claim to be true in the past with having good grounds to believe that that claim is, is false in the present. Those things don't have anything to do with each other. The fact that people believed you know, something to be true in the past doesn't mean that we should automatically assume that it's false in the present. You can see that that's bad thinking. Another variant of it confuses being new or modern or up to date with being true or good. And sometimes this gets called chronological snobbery. The idea is, you know, whatever is newest is, is uh, the, the, the replacement, you know. You look down your nose at the older stuff. 
Uh, it's also assuming that situations and conditions have fundamentally changed in relevant ways, making what was believed true, or perhaps actually true in the past, no longer true in the present. And there are some things about which that's actually the case. Technology changes like that. Does human nature fundamentally change? Mm, that, that one's a little bit questionable. People also sometimes confuse whether something is feasible or easy to adopt, you know, an alternative that, that's being presented in the present with that alternative actually being true or being good or being the one that we should select. So because people say, well, we can do it, we should do it. Or because something has become available, now we have to have it, now we should, we should uh, enjoy it, we should use it, we should buy it, we should sell it, we should, you know, go on uh, from, from there. So, you know, think, for example, about um, innovations possible in music. It's possible to do um, all sorts of cool things with your, your computer. Does that mean that you ought to? Should you all be making music? I don't know. You know, maybe not. Common situations where you're going to find this, this uh, fallacy being engaged in. So it frequently occurs in situations where some change is being proposed or introduced. That means you're going to find it in contexts that are dealing with politics and policy making quite often. Uh, aesthetic matters, fashion, cuisine, people want to be cutting edge, right? Organizations and institutions, um, there's like a whole industry out there of, you know, some of it's actually good, some of it's, you know, snake oil salesmen and charlatans coming in and, and you know, talking about how to, how to teach innovation or be a disruptor or, you know, all sorts of stuff along those lines. Um, religions and other belief systems. Oftentimes we associate religions with a kind of conservatism or tradition, but um, sometimes people are attracted to what's new as, as well, you know, um, and other belief systems, you know, that are, that are equally robust like religions, um, you know, can, can fit into that as well. Advertising uses this a lot. If it's new, it's good. So, you know, now with X, the product, um, you got to get this because it's the new and improved version. So in modern culture, the, the funny thing about this is the whole notion of being modern is actually quite old fashioned now, isn't it? We're postmoderns or uh, late moderns, you know, but we're actually all moderns. Newer is better becomes a very common assumption in modern culture and in the minds of many people. But it, it's, it, you know, that's sort of a catchphrase that we ought to question. Is newer always better? Um, oftentimes you're going to see it being connected with some vague notion of progress or evolution. And I don't mean evolution in the sense of biology. I mean evolution where we're talking about memes and, you know, social evolution and, you know, survival of the fittest of organizations. All this metaphorical stuff, right? Um, innovation, great catchphrase. Disruption is, is one that they've been using for like the last 10 years. Um, so these are common situations that you're going to, to see um, this fallacy being, being uh, used in. Let's look at some examples now. This is one that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, MOOCs. MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Classes. And if you remember back just a few years ago, they were going to totally revolutionize education. You notice I start this, this uh, argument out. The old ways of doing college and university classes is dead. Massive open online classes are the wave of the future for education. Just think about it. They leverage technology to make it possible for students anywhere to take classes with academic superstars, even on their cell phones. You know, we could add all sorts of other things in there, right? Wouldn't you like to take an ethics class with Peter Singer or, you know, a blah bitty blah bitty blah class with whoever the, the superstar is in, in that field? Therefore, the conclusion is we should replace older academic classes with MOOCs. Now, this is a terrible argument. Um, just the fact that MOOCs are new got a lot of people on board and very excited about them. I had people actually writing me and saying, Dr. Sadler, when are you going to do a MOOC? And, you know, I'd have to tell them, well, I haven't been invited to do a MOOC because I'm not a big name and I don't teach at an elite university where, where, where they're actually inviting people to do these sorts of things. Um, but I also think that MOOCs are bad pedagogy um, for, for some pretty, you know, important reasons. There's kind of bait and switch that goes on. 
because um, you're not taking a class with Peter Singer or or Sandow or you know like if Alistair McIntyre were to, were to actually do a MOOC, you know you wouldn't actually be in a classroom with them. You'd see videos, and then it's some um, guy like me or some you know who knows who who may not even have a, a you know high high level degree or publications or anything like that who's doing the TA position who you're actually interacting with. Now there's some good stuff built into them. They have some potential. They're they're not bad for, you know, teaching uh, comp sci stuff or certain technical things, but for teaching a lot of classes, the old this this, you know, we should replace older academic classes with MOOCs, terrible argument. Um, but it is, you know, a good example of this uh, appeal to novelty. Um, be interesting to see where they go from here. Example two, views in religion. Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, the world's four largest religious traditions. They're all basically approaches of life from back in the past. They're practically medieval. There's a little joke there on my part. I'll come back to that. How can you possibly live a coherent life in the modern 21st century with a perspective like that? The missionary church of Copamism is a brand new religion that started in the 21st century. If you're going to be religious, you should definitely become a Copamist. Or pick whatever else you like. Something 20 years old, 30 years old. But not one of those basically medieval religions. Now, you could, you could call Islam uh, medieval, I suppose, because historically speaking, yeah, that's, that fits in there. And there, there was Christianity in the Middle Ages, and there, Buddhism, you know, continued to develop, and Hinduism continued to develop in what we now call the Middle Ages. The roots of, uh, of Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity are, are considerably older. Um, Islam is a little bit newer, although, you know, they trace themselves back to, to uh, Abraham. Um, now, this is a common argument, and it's been made for really the last 150 or so years. We can't do this kind of religion. We have to have something that's up to date if we're going to be religious, right? The mere fact that this keeps got, you know, getting made over and over again and that there's a long tradition of making these, these modernist arguments ought to be uh, grounds for suspicion of that. Um, but, you know, when it comes to religion, you probably need some better reason to accept and adopt and live by a religion than that it's brand new. You probably shouldn't accept one just because it's old either. You know, there's if you're going to accept a religion, you probably should have some other grounds for that. So this is a, a, another great example. Um, fashion. What are you wearing? That's so last year. What are you, stuck in the past? And, you know, we could do this with, like, um, I can't believe you have an otter box for your iPhone. Nobody has those anymore. That was, you know, back in 2012, that was the cool thing. And, and the, the uh, unstated conclusion there is that, well, you shouldn't wear that, but instead the more current fashion. Again, is this a good argument? Not really. I mean, maybe you could make some sort of reasoned uh, case for why you ought to wear contemporary fashion. Like, you know, if I were to say, um, you know, it, it interferes with my teaching effectiveness to wear unstylish ties. This is one that my, my wife uh, got me to, to buy just recently. So this is presumably up to date. You know, this is, I guess, the in thing. Um, or at least it was the in thing a couple months ago. Um, but, you know, I'll hold on to ties for 20 years and, and uh, keep wearing them like a lot of guys. Does it actually interfere with my teaching effectiveness? Does it interfere with my ability to communicate? Does it, does it interfere with anything that, that's particularly important? Probably not. So yeah, this is kind of a bad argument. Now, let's talk about how you can spot this fallacy when it's coming up. There's some phrases that are sort of like, you know, red flags. If somebody is talking about things being cutting edge or now bleeding edge is another uh, phrase that people like, or innovative or innovation or disruptive, um, there's probably going to be an appeal to novelty, right? And it's funny too, because again, you can trace back a whole history of these. 
<laughs> these kinds of words uh, appeal to novelty turns out to have a long history of its of its own you should look to see whether the grounds that a person is providing for whether a claim should be accepted in the present have to do with other people's past belief in the claim or with the claim being something new that's that's a sign that there's something hinky going on there right that the appeal might be being made also keep an eye out for people on opposite sides trying to assert that their proposal is more innovative or new than the other persons we get into sort of bidding wars about well my idea is even more innovative it's going to change things even more than than this guy so we should adopt it that's not a good reason to adopt a uh, uh, proposal or to uh, take a position what's not the fallacy of appeal to novelty I have this section in here to help students um, practice things that they're probably gonna have to do on tests or, or homework assignments so there's there's really two main ones that you could mix up with the appeal to novelty arguments that stress that the majority of people in the present disagree with a claim are more likely appeal to exclusivity exclusivity is the correlative to popularity those have to do with the present you're making an argument from the present to the present appeal to novelty is really saying we need to get rid of the past because the past is no good so if they believe that in the past it's because they're a bunch of dummies and we're not going to believe that we're going to believe something else instead um, arguments that stress that by embracing the new or rejecting the old one gets to belong to a group are more likely an example of an emotional appeal called peer pressure which appeals to our our desire or our enjoyment in in belonging to to a group right so that's got some of the same elements um, but it's placing the stress on the the emotion in this case now not every argument which places a stress on the newness of some claim or its capacity to disrupt and shake things up is necessarily an appeal to novelty um, you have to look at these on a case-by-case -case basis how do you avoid making this fallacy in your own thinking your own decision making your own purchasing all these sorts of things that really matter to us well one of these is very common sense right don't assume that because something is newer it's necessarily better or more true or based on fuller knowledge or understanding great example of this Apple products um, I actually am using iMovie to record this right now and if you go to iMovie forums iMovie has gone through a lot of iterations it's in I think um, it's 11th main you know release right now and there's features that the older one had that were really great that Apple in its you know infinite wisdom decided to take out and new things that they put in that don't work so good you know for example in this video uh, my talking may not match up perfectly to my um, you know the video of my speaking you know what that that's caused by iMovie because it's not a high quality product like it used to be in the past so just because it's a newer version it doesn't mean that it's actually better it may be better in certain respects but uh, not in other respects um, same thing with books you know if, if a new book comes out on Aristotle that doesn't mean that that person is better than than you know Cooper or Julianos or you know uh, pick whoever else we want to talk about as great Aristotle you know interpreters um, it really depends on the on the product be careful about global assumptions about what people in the past knew or didn't know or even about what they supposedly believed and practiced this is a major problem that um, people in the present often have and it's a sign that people in the present sometimes aren't as smart as people in the past if you're getting most of your understanding of the past from channels like the History Channel or the Learning Channel you're probably you probably got a lot of mistaken assumptions about what people in the past thought because a lot of their shows are quite frankly garbage from a critical thinking perspective where you want the things to actually be based on fact it's too bad but you know that's actually the case some areas better some areas worse 
Um, there's a lot of canards, a lot of, you know, old wives' tales that are told about the past, particularly about the Middle Ages. Great example. Everybody in the Middle Ages thought the world was flat. Well, except for Thomas Aquinas, except for St. Anselm, who actually says, as we all know, speaking about educated people, the world is a globe. Um, so you got to be careful about these global assumptions about how smart we are and how dumb people in the past were. If you find yourself, this is the third thing, advancing some claim or idea just because it's new, try to, you know, rework it. Try to see if you can make a case for that same idea, but on other grounds. See if you can strengthen your argument so that you're not just making an appeal to novelty. Or if you think that it matters that it's new, make a case for why that matters. Spell that out to, to other people, and then you're not actually falling into the fallacy. Last thing that I want to say, this video is part of an entire series discussing common fallacies in reasoning and argumentation, and it belongs to a bigger channel devoted specifically to critical thinking, reasoning, and argumentation. So if you like this video, or if you found it useful for your own classes, your own development, share it with other people that you, you think might benefit from it, and come back to the channel from time to time to check out other videos and series. We're going to be uploading an awful lot of content in these three areas of critical thinking, logic, and argumentation.